Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be looking at dwarves, the short, fantasy humanoid race known for its skills in mining and metalwork. Dwarves originated in Scandinavian and Germanic myths, but it is likely the version we are most familiar with comes from the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien, such as The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, as this version is the one that has permeated into movies, video games and role-playing games until becoming the definitive modern version of dwarves. Our own version will be taking a bit from the modern Tolkien-esque dwarves and the ancient mythical dwarves, combining aspects and traits of both into a single being and seeing what this fantastic race would be like as real living organisms. This will also incorporate some ideas from people who asked to see this one in the comments, but more on that later. By the way, if you are enjoying our videos, please consider supporting the channel on Ko-fi, link available in the video's description. And, as always, I will be giving some design and biology notes at the end, so please stay if that is something that interests you. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Today we meet a creature that has walked along the road to civilization at the same time as humanity, and the two species have alternately found themselves at each other's throats or capable of coexisting and growing together. Dwarves came from colonial bees and have kept that social living during their evolution into bigger creatures. Their great increase in size gave them a great advantage against predation, as well as making their metabolism much more efficient and allowing them to thrive in their colder environment across northern Europe. This evolution happened in a manner similar to that of the skeleton wasp, but without reaching their enormous size. Instead, the dwarves are, in general terms, only half as tall as a human being. They are no longer capable of flying due to their increased weight, and their development is halted just before they reach adulthood saving energy and resources that are no longer needed to form wings and other structures. As a result, dwarves present neotenic characteristics and resemble whitish, six-legged bee pupae. Dwarves have the same fur as other bees do, and it is likewise used to carry pollen. However, their fur covers a much wider area, including their entire thorax and the frontal part of its body, helping protect it from the cold by creating a layer of insulating air close to it. Only its two frontmost legs are used for manipulating their environment, the other four remaining on the ground to help support its weight and that of its armor. That's right, armor. Dwarves live in tunnels below ground and inside mountains, and can use their saliva and pieces of rock and soil chewed off from their environment to sculpt enormous chambers and towers like those of the termites, as well as trap doors that become indistinguishable from the surrounding rock, protecting the entrance of their colonies. They will use this same technique to place pieces of rock and even metal on their bodies, creating armors that protect them despite the frailty of their exoskeleton, which is much thinner than that of smaller insects in order to avoid it from becoming too heavy. Dwarfs are mainly nocturnal creatures, and will only leave their colonies under the cover of the darkness. During the day, they will stay inside their vast complexes, completely immobile, indistinguishable from the rock that forms the tunnels they inhabit thanks to their armor. In the safety of these tunnels, barely mobile reproductive females, which can reach huge sizes, will lay eggs that contain the new generations, to be placed inside small shelters below ground level. After a few days, the young bees will emerge as larvae and finish their development into adults on the surface. 
Being colonial organisms, the safety of every individual is greatly dependent on their numbers. Dwarves will only leave their colonies in large squads of up to a dozen scouts as they search for flowers, from which they make their food. These flowers are massive and produce enormous amounts of pollen, having evolved convergently with these bees. Should any threat approach them, dwarves will depend on their stinger, as venomous as that of other bees. The pain caused by this stinger means only one sting is enough to make any potential danger escape, and any who has been stung several times will suffer a great agony in many cases dying in the midst of terrible hallucinations. The effects of this venom are so terrible that for a long time they were believed to be the effects of a curse that befell unwary travelers who stepped between mysterious circles of rocks. However, a lone dwarf could be easily disposed of by different predators, meaning the protection of their numbers is vital to their survival. Thus, strong bonds are formed between members of the same hive as they develop, and the protection of each other, as well as their young, is a big part of life in the colony. Whenever a member of the hive is damaged by a predator, the rest of the dwarves will immediately retaliate, thus removing threats from their surroundings and ensuring the survival of their colony. Just as other species of bee, dwarfs will produce honey to feed their ranks. However, due to the sheer size of dwarfs compared to other bees, certain measures are required to maximize food output for the colony. For this, dwarfs dilute their honey with water from nearby rivers, lakes and melted snow, and mix it with other sources of food such as fruits, berries and occasionally meat or even blood of creatures that have fallen to their stingers. During their evolution and development, dwarves learned to take extreme care of this mix in order to avoid its contamination, as in such cases it would no longer be useful to them and would have to be thrown away. As dwarves grew in intelligence and their societies advanced, specialization became necessary for their development, as it helped better manage and distribute what resources they had. Thus, scarce metals began being reserved for the armor of their warriors and certain tools and weapons, while rock armor was saved for their scouts, allowing them to more easily hide themselves and disappear in the wilderness. The metal tools, weapons and armors of dwarves became very intricate and beautiful in design, as well as amazingly strong once they figured out the secrets of smelting and forging, and human societies soon saw the value in their craft, seeking to obtain them at any cost. That is how the first peaceful contact between humans and dwarves was established, trading the creations of the dwarves for tools, precious metals, food and Later on, gold and money the dwarves could use to obtain other goods and services from humanity. While dwarves, being insects, have a very different way of communicating than humans, being based on movement and other signals rather than on spoken language, both species were very visually oriented, and so many symbols and signals were developed to allow each to understand the other starting with things as simple as armor, want or give, and developing into a complex enough system to allow for even casual conversation between a dwarf and a human. However, many humans were not as well intentioned towards dwarves, and the opposite was also true. Many people have resorted to stealing the treasured creations of the dwarves, leading to many conflicts between societies. This has not been helped by the communication barrier, which makes it hard for dwarves to properly judge the intentions of specific humans, and vice versa. 
Many times, naive travelers of one species have believed themselves to be dealing with a merchant from the other species, when in truth, they are being deceived by a thief or a murderer. While the society of dwarves is not free of rotten apples, their settlements are still very united, their culture greatly emphasizing the value of union and civil duty towards their kin. After all, cooperation has been vital for the survival of these colonial organisms, and while individuality is valued, it is still mostly accepted in terms of what the individual can do for its society. Dwarf culture is also greatly focused on caring after each other, especially those weaker or younger than oneself, once again owing to the specific needs of a colonial society. While in some colonies in the animal kingdom, the individual can become expendable in certain situations, as dwarf hypes grew into what they are now, the life of the individual became valued on its own especially as individual dwarves formed business relations with humans or learned specific skills from them. Although revenge killings of those who have caught their own are not as open as they were before, dwarven courses have never stopped finding those who hurt a dwarf. As dwarves are perfectly capable of seeing in the dark, their buildings and towns still remain in the shadows, free of torches or any other sources of light except for specially designed buildings meant to house occasional human visitors. Contrasting with their dark habitat, the proper names of dwarves often make reference to light and brightness, things they value immensely due to the life they give to everything around them, including the plants that serve as sustenance for their civilization. This is even reflected by their scientific name, Fortivellator Lucifilis, which means Mighty Warriors, Children of the Light. It should be noted that, being sapient beings, it was agreed that dwarves should be the ones to choose their own scientific name, and it is widely considered that they completely outclassed humanity at doing so. As dwarf societies grew bigger and more complex, their production of honey became an almost industrialized process, with colonies being extremely careful that their reserves were not contaminated or became unviable in any way. Soon, this duty fell on specially designated individuals, who were to continually check and taste the honey to ensure it was still in good condition. While they protected the honey from all possible contaminants, one particular kind of chemical process came to their attention. Fermentation. Alcoholic fermentation. Unlike with other types of contamination, fermented honey was not immediately harmful to dwarves, and it wasn't long before its effects were well understood. Fermentation was harnessed by the dwarves, perfected until it produced a drink identical in all important aspects to human meat, although often considered to be much superior in quality. However, this drink was at first exclusive to dwarven tasters, who had evolved into an almost shamanic role, using the meat to commune with the spirits, as well as using it as inspiration for amazing stories and deeply moving poems. With time, and thanks to the ample contact between human and dwarven societies, the use of this drink became much more extended, becoming allowed for recreational purposes and even for sale to humanity, which greatly improved trade and relations between both peoples. And that's it for a speculative biology look into dwarves. Lots of people have asked to see this one, even giving some great notes and ideas which were of real help when giving these creatures shape, especially given how vague they can be in their original stories. As I started reading about dwarves, I realized how little of what we know is actually in the original myths. For instance, legends that contain dwarves rarely even mention their appearance, including the fact that they are in any way smaller than other characters. That's right, since the height of dwarves is not actually relevant in any way to many tales where they appear, it is not mentioned at all in most cases. 
In fact, there is a theory that the height of dwarfs resulted from Christianization, which transformed them from lesser supernatural beings into literally small physical beings. That said, I did decide to make them small since their height is such a defining trait of them in modern times that they just wouldn't feel like dwarfs otherwise. I'd also like to talk about them being insects, which might be confusing for those familiar with their more modern portrayal. I decided to base them on insects because, as a few comments have mentioned before, dwarves in Norse mythology were created from the maggots that crawled on Ymir's corpse, Ymir being the giant from which Midgard was created, and Midgard being the whole world we inhabit, or a part of that world. It's honestly quite confusing. While working on the concept, I threw around many ideas, but finally decided to go with neotenic bees since their appearance would somewhat resemble that of a maggot. However, this did mean striping them of their strength, since a thinner exoskeleton that would allow for greater size would also be more fragile, limiting how much stress these dwarves can withstand. And yet, I'm not super bummed about it, since the strength of dwarves, despite being mentioned often, never really plays that big of a part in their stories. This insect model fits very well with two aspects of dwarf myths. First is the whole aspect of them creating the myth of poetry, an alcoholic beverage that would make anyone who drank it a great poet. It might sound weird nowadays, but this comes from poetry being a really big deal to the ancient Norse. Second is living underground, mining and doing metal work, which could easily be adapted from habits such as those of ants, termites and the bagworm, this last insect creating protective cases from materials found in its environment. What do you guys think? Did you enjoy this reimagining of dwarves? Remember, all of your suggestions are taken into account, so if there's any type of creature you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.